I'm going to recycle an old story. It's probably my favorite joke, and then take a little different turn out of it today. It's a joke that says two guys were in a bar, and they're watching the 11 o'clock news. A guy is going to jump from a tall building. $20, I mean, I'll give you $20 if he jumps. The guy says, okay. The guy jumps. The loser hands over the $20, and the other guy says, I can't take your money. I saw it on a 6 o'clock news before. <laughs> and the other guy says, I saw it on a 6 o'clock news too, but I didn't think he would do it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, you cannot bet on things where you already know the outcome. We all wish we could know the future, who you ought to marry, what you ought to take in college. We waited two and a half years to get a certain college son to decide what he was going to take in college. Finally, I had to say, decide. We don't want to pay $29,000 a year and not know where you're going with this. Settle it. But you're scared to make the wrong choice. What if it doesn't come out the way you'd like? A friend of mine, I was there at the wedding, had the prayer at the wedding. Just found out the other day she's gay and she's living with another woman. Not to take sides on this, but that wasn't what he thought. And he asked me as a pastor, how could I have known? I thought, I prayed. We all would like to know the future and have it all charted out and know that it's going to be successful, that we will not make the wrong choice along the way. We want the best car, the best computer, the best airline tickets, whatever it is. We'd like to know for sure. Except that part of being human is not knowing the future. People who have uh, the game being taped somewhere, what do they say? Don't tell me the score. Don't tell me the score. Because they know as soon as they know the score, it takes all the fun out of watching the game. Why is everyone standing as they watch Kobe take the last shot? Because they don't know how it's going to come out. We were all standing there when we watched Tiger Woods and the other player make the last shots. Because we didn't know. That's what the fun is. It's part of the fun of dating. Part of the fun of this is not knowing for sure and making the best gamble that you can. Interesting story about Columbia. The space shuttle that crashed had a... Uh, piece of insulation go away so they knew it turns out from the recordings of the ground control that they knew for a couple weeks that all those seven were going to die but they made a decision not to tell the seven which would have meant that the whole last couple weeks of their lives they would have spent knowing that they were going to die instead they got to spend two weeks doing great exploration and experiencing space and then they died unexpectedly. They don't, don't want them to know. Spoil the trip. But if you're here today, you probably wish that there was at least one thing that you could know for sure. Where do you stand with God? It's okay to be a little uncertain maybe about where major you should take or who to marry or what car to buy. But at least we'd like to know this. Can I just know this before I bet my whole life where do I stand on God? What is God really like? How can I be certain to be forever with God? This is forever. I don't know about you, but I grew up very scared of all those questions. Scared about the future, scared whether I was going to be in or not. Was I going to be good enough? Would I remember to have all the sins forgiven? I grew up scared of the last days, scared of the persecution, scared of all of it. Scared. Many of you, uh, my generation, grew up with a little book called Now. Mary Kay Silver wrote a little book, 17 years old. And it's all about the last days, and all of a sudden the signs are going crazy, and she takes off to the mountains, and her brother, parents don't go, pastor don't, doesn't go. And a whole little book, my school made a whole drama play out of it. We're all scared to death. As a young pastor, youth pastor in Portland, Oregon, 40 years ago, I brought in one of the conference officials to speak to my youth. Spent the whole time talking about the persecution and how we're going to be hung up by our thumbs and we're going to have our fingernails pulled out if we don't give up our faith. I had kids that went home and 
had to sleep in their parents' room that night, so scared. And I said, I don't, I don't think that was right. Someone told me about a high school down in Mexico a few years ago. They were having a week of prayer to try to dramatize it. They had a little deal, but they made it real. And they came in the middle of the night, and they got all the boys out of the dorm, and they herded them out. They took all their clothes. They're out there in the dark in their underwear. When these guys, the police came with flashlights and shined them in their faces and demanded that they give up their faith or they were going to die tonight and all their families would be killed. And then they admitted that it was all a drama to get them to think about how serious this is. Is that the way we're supposed to live? In fear? Fear of the last days, fear of the persecution. And virtually every Adventist that I have met at one time or another has had a dream of Jesus coming and not being ready to go. Many forms of it. I've had it. And everyone else is going and the angels are taking everyone else except you. And here they go. And you're still here. And you're not ready. Didn't do business with God. And we're afraid. And yet the story that we look at this week, when the angels came and Jesus was born and the angels came to the shepherds, what were the first three words that the angels said in Luke chapter 2, verse 10? Be not afraid. Satan has been telling lies about God for thousands of years. The angels have had to stand back while the prophets talked our other people were able to talk, but the angels didn't have much chance to say anything. As they watched people say terrible things about God, they heard people cursing the name of God, people worshiping pagan religions. Well, you have to do these things in order to pacify an angry God to be on your side. Angels are heartbroken. Somebody stop this. And finally, God assigns a group of angels to go down and sing to the shepherds. And they start off with that first phrase, be not afraid. Be not afraid. Great Controversy, page 659, says it has been Satan's constant effort for thousands of years to make people afraid of God. Steps to Christ, page 10 and 11, says it was to remove this dark shadow. The whole reason Christ came is to get fear out. I've had to work hard over the years to get all the fear out of my religion. Because I grew up afraid of the last judgment, afraid of my name coming up, afraid of the persecution, afraid of the close of probation, afraid of it all. Some of you remember the little story, famous story in Zimbabwe about the bus driver driving with a bus full of insane people on the way to the mental health hospital. On the way, he's thirsty. He stops at a bar to get some drinks. When he comes back out, the whole bus was empty. All his passengers were gone. He didn't know what to do, couldn't show up at the hospital with an empty bus. And so he went to the local bus sign. There were people lined up for a bus, and he offered the first 20 people a free ride anywhere they wanted to go. <laughs> Got them on the bus, drove them straight to the mental hospital, put them inside, and he told us, these people think they're okay, but they're crazy. You keep them. <laughs> <laughs> Took him three days to convince the authorities that they were okay to let back out to the world. How do you and I know that we will be able to convince God and the angels that we're okay? We do not belong here. We should be out with him. How will it be in the last days? But the angel said, don't be afraid. Go, go to Bethlehem. You'll find he's a baby. Philip Yancey says that's why he came as a baby. Babies can't hurt you. You don't have to be afraid of a baby. Go. You don't have to worry about getting close to God. You can go. The angel said, be not afraid, for we have good news to give to you of great joy. Today a Savior has been born to you. For all the people. And so I had to go through all my beliefs one by one. Took me a while 
to try to push away all fear because the angel said so. We cannot have any religion in our belief system that has any fear in it. It cannot have any bad news. That has to be all good news of great joy, and it has to all be about a Savior. The angels said so when they came down and had a chance to talk. I started thinking about when Jesus left what they call the ascension in Luke in Acts chapter 1. And another cloud of angels came, and they, two of the angels came down, and they said, as they're looking up, they said, this same Jesus, who you see being taken away from you is going to come back in like manner as you see him go today. This same Jesus. Same as what? Same as the one who was born back there in Bethlehem. He will not change. Same as the one who died on a cross. You don't have to worry that God is going to somehow start as a baby and somehow end up as a different kind of God. He will never change. This same Jesus will come back to you just the way you saw him in Bethlehem. Is that good news to you? You don't have to be afraid to get close to God. The same Jesus. And could I say, I'm guessing it's the same angels. The same angels who had a chance to go sing to the shepherds are also the angels to get to come down and take Christ to go back home. And the same angels. And whatever they said to the first coming, they say to the second coming. The angels will come down with Christ out of the sky and they will say the same thing. Be not afraid, for we have good news of great joy today. Today a Savior is born to you. God is never a God to be afraid of. He never changes. He never starts as a little baby in a manger and now becomes some judge and some tyrant. He is only the God that you can get close to. He is always the God of good news, the God of great joy, and he is never anything more than a Savior. Today, a Savior. Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Same Jesus. So if you don't have to be afraid of Jesus when he's a baby, then you will not have to be afraid of God, Jesus, when he comes back on the clouds. Same Jesus, same angels. And so, like I said, I had to go through all my beliefs. No more fear of God. No more fear of being lost. No more fear that if I sinned, I would be kicked out of the house and name taken off the list. No more. First John 5, I write this, that you may know that you have eternal life. He said to the thief on the cross, even though he was a thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. Even the disciples who absolutely were not perfect, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You don't have to worry about this. In my Father's house are many men. I'm going to come back for you that where I am there ye may be also. King David, not a very good king in many ways, did some terrible things. And yet he can say in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. All the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever don't have to be afraid don't have to be afraid and so there came a point not that many years ago where I decided I would refuse to be afraid anymore no longer afraid of being lost no longer afraid of being put out of the list no longer afraid of the last days no longer afraid of the judgment no longer afraid of the persecution Ellen White is crystal clear. We are not to bring the time of trouble down into our time. We are not to be afraid of the last days. We are not to use the shortness of time, she says, as a motivation to get people heated up for God. We are not to use fear. God wants nothing to do with fear in our relationship with him. I talk to people all the time who are hoping that their life will sort of at the right time come to sleep before the last days. They don't want to be part of any of that. Just sleep through it and wake up when Jesus comes. Not me. I'm not afraid. You go out there at the White House or NBC Studios or whatever, they have a grand Christmas tree. They take it, cut it out of a forest somewhere, and they bring it, and then they work for weeks to string million lights all over the tree. And then all of a sudden in the grand ceremony, they flip the switch, and the lights go on. God is just stringing the Christmas lights today. Maybe you're one of them. We're all Christmas lights. One of these days, he's going to flip a switch, and he's going to light the world 
I do not want to sleep through it. I want to see it. Amen? I am not afraid. Well, people want to ask me some questions usually right about here. They say, Pastor Dan, doesn't the Bible say, fear God and give glory to him, Revelation 14. First angel's message, Ecclesiastes, fear God and keep all the commandments. That is the whole duty of man. Yes, it does say that. But those words, it is not talking about abject fear, human fear of God. It's talking about reverence and respect and awe. And Ellen White was sitting on the platform and a young man was speaking and he was going to have prayer and he didn't kneel. And she said, young man, kneel. The angels have bowed down before the God of the universe. So yes, there was a time to have respect and godly fear of God, but not fear in a human way. What about all the Old Testament stories, Pastor Dan? Didn't God use fear there? What about Mount Sinai when God is shouting on top of the mountain and thunder and lightning? Wasn't that fear? People were scared. They said, don't let him talk like that to us again. You talk to him, and then you tell us, otherwise we will die. What about Korodathan and Abiram, the ground opening up? What about the Amalekites? What about Uzzah touching the ark? What about Lot's wife? Yes. We can't take long, but just say a couple quick things. Those are not the last word about God. Jesus is always the last word about God. Those are not core. Jesus is core. We take our theology of God from Jesus and not from all those stories. And we have to understand God in a broken human world trying to do the best he can to reach out to people. He has two ways to teach you. He can either have you learn by you experiencing the consequences of your choices or you can learn by seeing someone else go through the consequences of their choices. And he said, rather do that. And so once in a while, with tears streaming down his face and heartbreaking, he chooses a few people at pivotal crossroad moments to go through some horrible things. And he telescopes the whole series of consequences into a short moment, hoping that we will see that's what happens. Okay. And Lot's wife has a terrible thing happen to her, and we all learn the lesson. Don't look back. Don't look back. But these are not God's last word about who he is. Jesus is always the last word. Get your theology of God from Jesus. I was uh, having dinner with one of our families in Chicago. This family and this lady and her daughter just ate with us a few weeks ago, Riverside. We were at the house, a group of young doctors and all their families Christmas Day, when all of a sudden this lady, doctor's wife, went crazy and began to yell at her little girl. She was our children's ministry coordinator. I thought, boy, this is not very good to have our children's ministry coordinator yelling at her daughter like this. And she was yelling, Jerrica, get away from there. Get away right now. What we couldn't see, because we were behind a wall, is that that little three-year-old girl was putting Christmas wrapping into the fire, in the fireplace, and the fire was starting to come out into the family room with that paper. And she was 30, 40 feet away with tables, tables to go around. There was no time to have a quiet little discussion. Honey, fire is dangerous, you know, please. We <laughs> no, we cannot. There are times when a parent has to yell, amen? Yeah. I'd be careful which of those times, all right? And there were times when God, in great love, let it be known when fire will burn you. Number three, someone in my small group this week asked this. They said, but Dan, aren't there times when <laughs> it's good to have a little bit of fear? Don't we need just a little bit of fear to keep us focused, to keep us living a moral life? Otherwise, we will think that it doesn't matter whatever you do and there will be no consequences. Don't there need to be a little bit of fear of the consequences of being lost to keep you living a moral life. Don't we need to be different from the rest of the world? Shouldn't being a Christian make you look different, sound different, and act different? I said, I absolutely agree that Christians should be different from the rest of the world. Yes, we want to be like Jesus, but never, never motivated by fear. What does the Bible say? Perfect love casts out fear. God doesn't want one bit of fear, not one percent, 
to be part of our motivation to live a godly life. He wants it to only be love. Pastor Tuan uh, gave me a little video clip this week. I can't show it to you. It takes way too long, but it's pretty funny. This guy had had five DUIs. And uh, his friends were sick about this. What could they do to wake him up and snake shake him out of this? And so they went and rented some hospital equipment. They took an office in the office building, and they made this room like a hospital room. It had the IV and the monitor and the TV and everything. And this guy was stone drunk in his truck. And they carried him, they put him in the bed and strapped him down. And then when he began to walk, wake up, they had a video, it's on YouTube, and they began, and he, a, a guy pretended to be a doctor, and he said, you have been in a coma for 10 years. <laughs> Is that good? And they had the whole thing choreographed. And your daughter, who was three, is now 13. It is now 2023. And they had a news clip on the television, and it was President Hillary Clinton. Sorry for some of you who might not be happy with that. <laughs> All right? <laughs> and this guy, are you kidding? I've missed 10 years. And they played it out and played it out. And all of a sudden, the friend began to slap him in the face. And he said, no. But five DUIs, you are done with it. Wake up. Come on. What is wrong with you? And the two began to just fight there. Like, five DUIs. Is that the best way to use a little bit of fear? Maybe that will work. Maybe that will be a motivator. But most of us find out that fear is not a long-term motivator. It is Jesus and gospel and grace and love that gives us the long-term motivation. One of my favorite stories, I hope you will not misunderstand, John Cole is our cardiologist in our church. He's up skiing a couple weeks now. I visited him early got here, and he told me that his favorite phrase, he, he finds that using negative motivation as a doctor to get people to live right, eat right, comply with his medication is not negative and fear. So he asked people, what do you love in your life? Do you really want to keep that? That's your reason to live a healthy life. So he asked one lady, and she said, what do you love about your life? Oh, he asked the husband first, what do you love about your life? And he says, making love. Then he asked the wife, what do you love about your life? Shopping. You explain it to the others, all right? <laughs> you get the idea. Now, one last thought before we're done. From the middle of the night. I would like to suggest to you a whole new idea today. That you have to get rid of a f the first fear in order to be able to get rid of other fears. I would like to suggest to you that fears are sequential. That there are doors of fears and you cannot deal with those doors until you go through this particular door. And you have to go through this particular door about your fear of God and whether you are saved and have your name on God's list or not before you can unlock the other doors of fears in your life. I would like to suggest this. That once you get this first door figured out, that you do not have to be afraid of God, that God is not a reluctant God, that God is not trying to watch and keep you out of heaven. God is a God of only grace and only good. And when you know that you are under grace and you have settled that with God, then you are able to now go on to the next levels and conquer other demons and get rid of other fears. And you are able to take more chances in life and live a more adventurous life and take more chances and try new foods and go on mission trips and take more risks because you have settled one big fear in your life. Settle it. And if you are struggling because you're not making as much headway in some places, you're searching for God's will in your life, maybe it's a signal that you haven't dealt with this particular fear yet. And you're still a little bit afraid that God has really accepted you and forgiven you and that the God is only good news and today a Savior is born to you. Many of you have heard me talk about Hilda in our first months of dating. And I was scared to death to touch her, so for five months didn't touch her at all. And every Saturday night I would vow, tonight's the night. I am going to hold hands tonight. 
It sounds stupid, but that's what I did. <laughs> Horrified that she would think that somehow pastors were just a little weird. And finally, one night at this Dorothy Hamill skating exhibition concert, I spent the whole two hours trying to gird up my courage and finally, finally held hands. And it was clear that we had gone to a new level of the relationship. Getting rid of a fear allowed us to go to a new level, which then allows you to check out the next level. <laughs> then there was the first kiss at the airport and so on. You get the idea. <laughs> the fears are sequential, and you have to get work through the first one in order to be able to get to the others. Which is why it says in Psalm 37, 4, delight in the Lord. And then he will grant you the desires of your heart. If you have found that maybe you are not really getting the desires of your heart, could it be that you have not delighted in the Lord? God is not still a God that you feel safe with. And you have to settle this first. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. When you get that fear out of the way, then God will release you to experience the rest of what he wants to give you in your life. You have to go through the first door before you can go to the second door. If you go skiing, as we're going to do on Monday, if you start with the green runs and then you go to the blue runs and then you go to the black diamonds with David Carnes and go skiing down the steep mountains. But you cannot just go out to Monday and start rocketing down. You have to go through the levels. If you want to, you have to go through American Idol. You have to go through every level. You play video games. You go through the levels. You have to get this issue settled. Where are you with God? Do you have this issue settled? You are going to heaven. You have a mansion in heaven. And that you have no fear of God. Settle that. Then you can go on to the rest. So if you live in a world of unknowns and uncertainty, settle this. This is one thing you can bet your life on. God is good. And God is love. And God is good all the time, forever. The same yesterday, today, and forever. I thought about the text in Jeremiah 29 where it says, I have plans for you and plans for good and not for evil. And most of us want to skip this first issue about the goodness of God and skip to that one. We're not really sure about God's goodness as far as salvation and our sins and forgiveness and heaven. But we want to skip right to this one. And we want God to be good and answer our prayers and give us miracles and do things for us and heal us and guide us in every way. You can't go to that level of goodness with God without going through the goodness of God on salvation first. You cannot pick and choose. You cannot slice God up. God is either all good or he is just not God. God has to be good in every single way, and he's good for salvation, and he's good for plans. He is good all the time. You cannot skip this particular question. And if I can just be as clear as I can be to you today, it is the same God. It's the same Jesus. It's the same angels. God is good. The God who was at Christmas in the manger is the same God who died on a cross. And the God who was at Christmas is also the God who will come back with clouds with a sickle in his hand to harvest the world. It is the same God, and it never changes. And the same God who was at Christmas will also be the God who comes down in the city of New Jerusalem and has the great wine throw judgment. God is always the same. He is always good. He is always good news of great joy, and he's always a Savior born for all the people. That's the gospel for you today. Settle it once and for all in your life. And you think about these angels, just before I'm done here. The angels came to sing. Just before that, someone pointed out in my small group this week that Gabriel says to Zechariah, I have just come to you from in the presence of God. These angels that sang in that choir had been with God forever, long time. And they come down and says, we want you to know what God is like. He is not like the lies Satan has told the angels, the same angels come back and take him back. And the same angels will come down on the cloud in the east and take us back to heaven. And we go down to the book of Revelation chapter 5. And it says at the end of the three comings of Christ, there will be a time in the great white throne judgment 
when everybody will begin to bow and sing down and worship God. And it says in verse 11, there will be a time when there are thousands times thousands of angels, 10,000 times 10,000. And all the angels are going to bow down and they will sing what we sing today. Worthy is the Lamb and He is worthy of power and glory and strength and all the rest. Do you trust the angels who have been in the presence of God and they say, God is like this. And he never changes. He's a baby. You can get close to him, and he will never change. Not even at the end of the judgment, he will never change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Get rid of any fear you may still have of God today. So I just encourage you, I cannot take away every question. I cannot tell you who you will marry or what your major should be or what job you should take or what lottery ticket numbers you should put in or whether the Lakers will win this season or not. But I can tell you this. God is good all the time. And God is love all the time. Amen? Three guys who were engineers and three guys who were accountants were going to a conference. And they noticed that the three engineers only bought one ticket for the three of them. They said, how did you do that? Well, you watch and see. They got onto the train. The three guys sat in their seat. The three engineers crammed into one restroom. And closed the door. Conductor came along, knocked on the door, and he said, tickets, please. And they opened the door a crack, and one arm went out, showed him the ticket, punched it, came back. Very good. One ticket for three. So, okay. So, on the way back, the accountant said, we're going to do that too. So, they bought one ticket for three. The engineers didn't buy any ticket. How are you going to do that? Watch and see. They got on the train. The three accountants got in one restroom. The three engineers got in another. Train began to go. A little while later, the engineer, one engineer came out, went across the aisle to the knock on the door, and he said, ticket, please. <laughs> if that's all you remember, fine. Just remember this, if you want to get where you want to go, there's only one ticket for everybody, and you got to walk across the aisle and get it, and you'll get where you want to go. Amen?